Well, howdy everyone. Sorry it's been so long since I've done a video. Believe me, I've I've tried uh, three or four of them the past month. I've, I've been wanting to talk about mental health, mine especially. Um, each video I did try to do, I just didn't feel like I was I don't know, getting my point across very well. But I'm going to try it this time, and whatever works, works. But when it comes to my mental health, I want to talk about what I've been diagnosed as, you know, for. Um, I got a list here because there's a lot. <laughs> Bipolar disorder. Manic depression, um, post traumatic stress disorder, um, oppos oppositional defiant disorder, uh, explosive disorder, major de de depression. Um, panic attacks, uh, and the seasonal affective disorder. Now that I've got the terms out, what I'm going to try to do is do a timeline of when all this started, according to my therapist. My depression started, I guess, when I was eight years old after I was molested by a family member. Because I, I, I had no one to tell what happened. I had to live with that. I had to live with that. To my to a few years after my daddy passed and I finally broke down and told my mom because I knew if I told dad he would have killed him so here I was dealing with that demon and then a couple years after that when I was about 10 my papa Shortridge passed away, and that was the first time of dealing with death. So I got really depressed about that. I, you know, my papa, he, he was a good man. He was always sick, though. Was very fragile. And then you know during school especially elementary school and middle you know what they would consider middle school but we didn't have middle you know people made fun of me because i was a chubby kid fat kid whatever you want to say it. so i didn't really have many friends it was just mostly my cousins that i was really close to I was able to play with everybody else made fun of me and then also in elementary you know I, I had to deal with a bully used to beat my ass every day he, he was bigger than me and I was the second biggest all in the school until the principal called and told, told my mom to tell dad that I, I have to step up and fight this fucker. Or he'd bullied me the rest of my life, which I did. I went and after Dad came home from work one night, 2 o'clock in the morning, woke me up, cold dirt still on his face. He told me, he said, you gotta, you gotta go whip his ass, Rod. 
I know you don't want to fight, but you ain't got no choice. Because if you don't, every time that boy whips your ass, I'm going to whip your ass. If I went to school the next day, beat the fuck out of him. He never fucked with me no more. They were right. But I felt bad for him. That added to, I guess, depression that I didn't know I had growing up. You know, in high school and stuff, I had to pretty much fake who I was, who I really was, you know, to make any type of friends. So that way they wouldn't make fun of me because of either my weight or the way I looked at life or, I don't know. I had some really close friends, three of them, when I was growing up. David, John, and Brad, I know you all heard me talk about them before. David's the oldest one. I met David when I was about five years old. His dad and my dad worked together, and we'd drive by their house, and Dad'd see Harold out, and we stopped, and me and Dave would go out and play in the yard, play in the creek. <laughs> And while in high school, you know, in my senior year, got the bombshell that we was going to move here to Tazewell. I begged them to wait till I graduated, but they wouldn't. So I added to the depression and have to go and tell the people I made friends with and the people I grew up with, that I was moving away. And I was so terrified I wasn't going to be able to graduate with them, but I was able to work something out to where I could go the last six weeks of garden and graduate with them. But you know, being away from them for six months and then going back, things had changed. They changed, I changed. It wasn't the same. That added to the depression. And then by moving up here, that's where I met my first wife in school and I guess I was rebellion and stuff and Married her in 1987. Well, she was pregnant. She told me she was pregnant. They said I'd do the right thing. Even though he, he hated her. He knew what she was. Daddy kept saying she's a whore, Rodney. You don't want, you don't want no whore. Well, dumbass me didn't realize it and tried to do the right thing. Then, like a month after we were married, she said she was pregnant. And I'm like, well, I thought she was already pregnant. And I was, like I said, in 1987, that was 88 then. So I knew she lied. Kind of like trapped me. Added to the depression because married her without a job because I'd been laid off from the tip while I was working at. Then got a job working with her family, cutting, working for CNA Wood Products, cutting gas well right away for these coal mines, which I worked with her uncle. Which is an asshole. He treated me like shit. Most of their fa her family treated me like shit. My all. Her sisters were pretty good to me. Her mom was pretty decent. 
some of her aunts and uncles were pretty decent, but there were some, boy, they couldn't stand me. So I just added to, to depression, thinking, I, what the fuck did I do? Then my son was born in October, uh, not September of 88. I was like, wow. It was great. It, to me, it was a great moment. But later on in life, as he grew up, he, I mean, he was a happy kid. But then he, something happened and he, he, he turned dark and got quiet. It was drugs. He got into drugs. That added to the depression. Anxiety and all that bullshit. Then I found out a few months after Aaron was born. Found out she's pregnant again. Then... October of 89, my son, my youngest son was born, and he, uh, was sick, I'd take him to Charlottesville, he was up there for a week, he just kept losing weight and losing weight, he wouldn't gain no weight, and the doctor said he was going to die, he didn't gain no weight, and he finally gained some weight. Within a couple of days, was able to bring him back home. He's he's still alive today, <laughs> going through his fucking problems like everybody else. But that added to the depression. All this shit is just building and building and building. I was never really an angry person, unless you you know unless you wrong me or something like that, and then I can go fuck off. Just like anybody else. I've always tried to control my temper, but with all these mental problems I had going on, it just kept building and adding. You know, working a job you bust your ass out for, and and you don't don't get paid shit. You know, back then I was making three dollars and fifty cents an hour, raising trying to raise two kids and and a wife and you know she she was working at McDonald's and not making much more or making about the same or something like that I know one time I got so depressed and down I called a friend of mine I grew up with and talked to her about the you know, what was going on, and she, you know, my ex-wife found out, and oh, Lord, thought I was cheating. Thought she said I was cheating. I don't know how the fuck can I cheat? The only thing I was doing was working. If I wasn't working at my job, I was coming up here and helping Dad, working around the house and stuff. I didn't know then, but, you know, people say that, you know, keep saying that you're cheating, they're the ones cheating. That's the fucking truth. So in uh, 90, 1990, I was sitting on the tailgate of my truck. Next wife drives by with my boys, way down. I go home that evening, apartment's cleaned out. Took everything, she left me. I searched everywhere to try to find my boys. Couldn't find them up all night, worried. I didn't know what the fuck was going on. Going crazy. I went there to work the next day to tell my boss that I got I got to find my kids. And while I was there, a deputy showed up and gave me the paperwork. And she divorced me. She wrote $2,500 worth of bad checks to get out in my name. 
I thought it was my mind, man. My daddy helped me. Daddy helped me get out of that mess, and I worked my ass off to pay him back. You know, I'm trying to tell, one thing I'm trying to tell people, you know, if you ain't got a job, you ain't got education, other than high school or training or something, don't get married when you're fucking young. You ruin your life, man. Especially, you know, you start having youngins. Because you got to take care of them youngins. You got to love them youngins. And it's hard to love your kids and be torn with a divorce and, and trying to work. And then you got child support and all this other bullshit. And then they take 65% of your fucking income. See, I used to get paid once a month. I'd make about $500, $550 for the month. Huh. After that shit started, I only made 50 bucks. I had to move back in with my parents. You know how hard that is? Until I finally got my play, got my own place. Finally. I forgot the shit straightened out. Then I dealing with that. I didn't I, you know weight balloon back up because I've lost a lot of weight. And my weight blew back up and some friends of mine around here at Tazewell said, man, you know, you get out. So I started going to the park with them and playing volleyball and stuff. I lost the weight and started to feel good about myself again. And then I, then I met my second wife. I wasn't going to marry her. But I ended up getting her pregnant. Daddy said, you got to do the right thing. you you, know, you got to marry her. I said, yeah, we've seen what happened the first time. He's like, yeah, but I, I like this girl. This girl's a good girl. She'll stand by you. And, uh, here you have that, that depression shit and that worry and all that happening all over again. Sorry, I lost my place. My brother stopped by. But I was talking about my second wife. Met her in 1991. Uh, my divorce hadn't been final yet. It's just a few months before it'd be final. But met her in 91, and before that, I went on a few dates. I wasn't looking for no relationship or nothing. I'd just been in, going through a divorce, and it's hard. It's hard losing your kids, man. I got, to, at first, when we went to court, you know, she had full custody. I didn't have shit. I had to fight and fight. It took about a couple years before I could get joint custody and could see my boys every other weekend. Before that, it had to be on her terms. And what sucked were I told her about what happened to me when I was a kid. Well, my cousin fucking molested me she used that against me and tried to say I molested my kids or my oldest I had to go front I had to go and talk to the sheriff's department and everything they did a big investigation I told him I said you take my kids to the fucking doctor both of them I want to know I was so tore up about that shit I didn't know she had anything to do with it till later And found that the boys hadn't never been hurt or touched. Boys never even said anything like that. She just made that shit up to try to put my ass in jail for nothing. Here comes the anxiety. Here's the depression. 
all of a sudden here comes the explosive disorders. I'm getting madder and madder over this bullshit. Every time I turn around, she had my ass in court for more money, more money, more money. I spent over $60,000 in lawyer fees. I had every, damn near every fucking lawyer in Tazel trying to fight her. And they all lost. But, you know, like I said, I met, I met my second wife in uh, 91. Uh, like I said, she and I got her pregnant. She wanted to get married. I didn't. Dad kind of forced my hand on that. So I married her. Married her. Uh, a, little, a little more than a, a little more than a month before my first daughter was born, but I got a job working in Roanoke. I had a job up there working in Roanoke year before, back in '91, working at a print shop. But they could keep me busy. I was only working a couple of days a week. I told him, I said, shit, Bart, I can't do this. Even though I was making more money, I wasn't making enough compared to working all week down here. So I told him, I said, I got to come, I got to go back home. I got to go back to Tazel. And got my old job back with that kiss ass. Huh. It's like every time I've tried to do things to make my life better, I always go one step forward and 15 back. But those people decided to open up nothing but a print shop and have me run it. And I went from making $4 an hour then to $10 an hour, which back then, that was a lot of damn money. So I was excited about that and they let me work four days a week. Four tens, and then I was able to come home for three days. But 30 years ago, this year, a lot of, a lot of things started happening that cascaded into my mental health just going to fuck. Like I said, I got a job in Roanoke. Where they'd opened up a new print shop. My manager over. Making good money. Things are going good right there. Um, I married my second wife. She about ready to bust to have her first daughter. Um, then I came home because I've, worked, I've been up there for a month. I've been trying to get everything all lined up. Everything going real good. Had a cutter break down and couldn't do anything to get it fixed until the next uh, week. So uh, I, they, they told me to just go home for the weekend. So I did. And my brother at that time was working in North Carolina. And he had a piece of equipment break down. So he had to come home. Just, I mean, he was in North Carolina and I was in Roanoke. And there's two ways to come up this holler to where you can go to our house or mom and dad's house. And uh, we met at the bottom of the hill. He came in one way and I came in the other. I thought that was odd. But this is October... Uh, 23rd. And uh, me and my brother and my wife decided that, you know, we was going to go to the movies and it was going to go watch a western. And Clint Eastwood Western. Daddy loved Clint Eastwood. So I begged Dad to see if he didn't want to go because he'd never been in a theater. No, nah, no, nah, I'll wait till it comes on TV. I said, you sure? Yeah. Dad was happy to see us that day too because he was sitting on the porch and both of us put up on the hill. And uh, we went to the movies, and we went out and ate and hung out. And 
me and my wife got back home. She went to bed. I ate me a sandwich and get ready to go to bed. And I told Daddy, I said, well, Good night, Dad. I love you. He looked at me sitting on the couch. He said, What? You too old to give your old man a kiss? I said, Hell no. Went over there and gave him a kiss on the cheek and I rubbed his head, messed up his hair, which he hated. You touch his hair, he, oh Lord, did he go off. He's like, don't mess with the dude. And I laughed, he laughed. I went on the bed and went to sleep. I was, it wasn't, maybe an hour, I heard my mom scream bloody murder. And daddy was having a seizure, which we thought was a seizure. It was actually he had a blood clot that was going from his lungs into his heart. So we tried to get him up, to get him out the door, and he collapsed on us. And me and my uncle tried to give him CPR to get him back. And well, yeah, we lost him. I went to a dark place after that. Something like 12 years. Hell, it's been 30 years, almost, and just like yesterday to me. Then the depression, the PTSD, and all this other shit starts getting worse and worse. And that was in 92. I was numb to the world, man. I was hating the world. I said shit to people. I had to go back later on and apologize to them because I was just so pissed off. Some accepted, some didn't, which uh, the ones who didn't, I understand. But I made mistakes, bad mistakes after that. Drinking and doing things I shouldn't have been doing. Lying, not coming home, being with people I shouldn't be with. You just go into a dark place, man. If you've never been there, the darkness just overwhelms you. It does stay it today. Sometimes I take medication, it helps. Especially helps with the outbursts, me getting mad and cussing, raising hell, throwing shit, you know, those type of outbursts. But I have a tendency, I guess I say stuff, I've done it all my life, I say stuff to hurt people's feelings, and I don't mean to. And if I ever hurt anybody's feelings, that's something I've said, you gotta let me know. Because I think I'm joking, and you may not take it that way. I don't like, I don't mean, or don't like to offend anyone purposely. That was 92, and then in November, uh, my second wife had her first daughter. I just, I was, I, could, I was trying to be happy, but Dad was still on my mind and I, I, I love my I love my daughters all my heart and my boys but I feel like I just didn't give them enough of me when they needed me the most and I hate myself for that I can't go back and fix it then the job I had in Roanoke Due to some bullshit, you know, salesmen want more money, caused me to end up having to quit that job because I was going to shut it down. So, while I was out doing wrong things, I went to school and got my CDL license, which that was a fucking mess. 
they treated me like shit. You know, it sucks being a big guy. I know a lot of people say, oh, being a big guy, that's great, that's great. No, it sucks. Everybody fucking makes fun of you, talks talks down to you or something like that. And when I was taking a driving school up there with, well, them some bitches treat me like shit. Except one old trainer. One old trainer's the only one that took me under his wing and taught me what needed to be taught and didn't talk down to me or nothing. But I got my CDLs, got a job, never been further than Tennessee. And then here I was out in fucking California. You talk about shock. And here comes the depression even more, worrying about what's going on at home. Ex-wife taking me to court. That's all I got a job. Making a little bit more money. She got to get it. Even though I never missed a child support payment or nothing at that time. So from 95 to 2000, what, 2004? I drove, you know, I drove a truck. I had to miss a lot of kids' stuff, games, birthdays, you know, miss holidays and stuff because I was on the road. Or I was working at an oil field because I, I quit driving a big rig and started hauling uh, cement to these gas and oil wells. Worked for Dow Well, one of the biggest companies in the world at that time. Made good money, but shit, party. I ain't believing you ever going home. Depression, depression, depression. That's all my life has been, man. I have fought demons for so fucking long, and I find them it's still yet today. I know in what was it? I think it was 94 or 95. I got so down that I, I, I tried to off myself. There's a big snowstorm coming in. It's about January, February. I went up to Cove Creek, place I used to hunt and fish, back up in an area where I used to camp. Took my, I had a 44 auto mag back then. I kept with me. I don't carry a gun no more because of, just because of this. I was hurting so bad. Didn't know what to do. And dead up to my eyeballs. Just having to fight all the time. Court, kids. Dealing with daddy's death. I said, fuck it. I'm done. I put that son of a bitch upside my head. And I knew there was one already in the chamber. I pulled the trigger. Nothing. Uh, popped that bullet out. Looked at it. I still have it. I used to carry it with me all the time, but I lost it. And then my son found it up at the cemetery. I guess I lost it when I was mowing or something. And uh, it's in there on the shelf. Just a reminder. But I stuck the gun out the window and fired two shots in the air. Couldn't believe it. You know, people say that people that commit suicide takes a coward's way out. Let me tell you something. It takes a fucking ball to pull a trigger. Especially when it's pointing at your own damn head. And I, I guess I kind of realized right then I gotta live. I gotta live for my kids. 
no matter how hard it's going to be, rest the way. I got, I got to hang in there for them, and I have. Even though they don't come around much, even though they don't call, even though they don't have nothing to do with me, all the suffering I did was for them. I took, I took it all on my shoulders. I didn't want none of them to suffer. I didn't want none of them to hurt. I hated that they grew up poor. I wish I could fix all that. But when you're raising two families, it's impossible. And I couldn't imagine trying to do that today. And you women wonder why men don't want to fucking date or get married or none of that shit. It's because they know you all have all the power. And I'm not trying to be sexist. It's just the way the court system's set up. It's not fair to men. The only thing we are is a fucking ATM. You can be a, you can play daddy for two, three, four days out of the month. That's it. Ain't right. Now you not when you got a man that loves his kids or would do anything in the world for him. These men that just walk out the door to get them packed of cigarettes and never come back. Now fuck them. But I got, I kept getting sick when I was driving the truck. Gaining weight, gaining weight, gaining weight. In 2003 when they finally pulled me off the truck. Or something like that. I weighed 525 pounds when I was a diabetic. Here comes the fucking depression hitting hard again. Can't work. I try to get other jobs where I wouldn't be in a truck where it would help me. No. Either I was too educated or too experienced or not enough. I had heart problems, starting to have heart problems and liver problems. Doctors suggest I go ahead and sign up on my disability, which I didn't want to. But I had no choice. I couldn't get a job. Nobody hired me because I was such a high risk for their insurance. You know, who wants to hire someone that could fucking collapse and die on their damn floor or office or whatever? And face a lawsuit or something like that. Nobody wants that. But it took three and a half years for me to get my disability. And by goddamn, we suffered. We, we suffered bad. And I stayed so depressed because I couldn't do the things I used to do. That's just like now. I can't do the things I used to do. And it pisses me off. It makes me mad. I'll get out and I'll try. And then within just a few minutes, I'm so wore out or hurting so bad or, I mean, damn, this diabetes just fucked me up bad. I'm constantly fighting the mental illness, the, the, the disease of diabetes, uh, the nerve damage that is done to my hands, my feet. Hell, I can't even feel my feet. I can't feel my feet that if I'm on an angle, like I, I, on, a, on a little bit of a bank, my ankles will, uh, will uh, twist on me. Hell, I can walk on level ground sometimes and they'll twist on me where I can't feel my feet. I can't feel where I'm stepping. My hands are getting bad to where, well, hell, I ain't been able to type in a year. I can't, I, I drop my cigarettes, I drop a pen. I stay depressed about all this shit. I get angry at myself. I get angry at the world. I try to fight it. It's just so hard. I, I just feel so useless. I haven't contributed nothing to this world. 
nothing to my family, nothing to my friends. That's the reason why I embrace death. If it comes, which it's tried many times, I don't know why or how I fight back and still keep kicking. But something is keeping me here. I guess it's myself. I guess it's cause them grandkids I got. I got five grandkids and another one on the way next month. But my first one, half pint. That girl means the world to me. I mean, don't get me wrong. All the rest, all the other ones mean the world to me too, but. Something about half pint. I guess it's the fact that she keeps me going. You know, she'll message me now and then or come spend a night or two or three and she 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 keeps me going. I like to spend more time with the rest of the grandkids. I'd like for them to get to know me if I'm worth even getting to know. But yeah, I feel useless. Whether it be my art, graphics I do, photography I do, or did, I don't do none of this stuff no more. Pandemic kind of kicked me in the nuts. Thank goodness I ain't never caught the COVID, but it's turned me into a homebody. I just don't, I don't like going nowhere. I like doing stuff here. Home. But yeah, I deal with a lot of anger issues and I try to control my anger. I try, medication helps a lot with that. The PTSD with that and plus when I was working in North Carolina, <coughs> as an accident happened where a little baby lost its life. I was working and it crashed in the medium and got the parents out, but the lady was screaming that there's a, her baby was still in there and I went up to try to get it and they pulled me out because the SUV was on fire and the time they got me back it popped and the fire went everywhere. So, didn't make it. Plus, you know, I've had fam uh, family and friends have passed away suddenly. That's affected me. I got, I got a lot of empathy in me. Doctor said that's not necessarily a bad thing, but it can be because, you know, when I was on the road, I'd give money to people that were on the streets, you know. There's times I'd go a week or two without eating because I'd give all my money away. And I had other co-drivers raise hell. Well, I don't know why you're giving them fuckers money. Well, because I was taught to. My daddy always told me if somebody asked for help, try to help them best you can. And that's what I always did. Because I knew eventually I was going to go home and I'd have a sandwich or something waiting. But if they drunk it up or stuck it in an arm or whatever, that's on them. I did what I was taught. But yeah, my therapist, she uh, she got into some deep shit with me. And I guess what I'm, what I'm trying to say is, you know, it doesn't hurt to ask for help. It took me a long time to learn that. 
And with the help of a therapist, I've learned that I can talk to her. There's some people, you know, family and friends that I used to talk to about certain things, but I haven't seen them in a few years. So I deal with the demons. That's why I call them. I mean, like, you know, they are demons. They're in my head. I've sat and had moments where I've cried for days. And other days I've been so damn mad I, I couldn't even stand to look at myself in the fucking mirror. I know there's just a handful of people that care about me and love me. And, you know, they keep saying you're supposed to love yourself, but I hate myself. That'll never change. I hate what I've become. I've hated the choices that I've made. You know, growing up, I never even thought of going down the road that I went down, but I forced it upon myself and I dealt with it the best I could. But if you need help, reach out and get it. There's numbers you can call. There's people out there listening. I just thought I'd try this video one more time and I hope this one work because I've had really struggle tried to struggle to, to do this. But I appreciate, you know, you all, you know, taking the time to listen, to watch. And if this helps one person to see that you're not the only one out there that's struggling with everything. I mean, I've struggled with alcohol. I was an alcoholic. Uh, you know, I wasn't much into drugs. I never, I never did. I mean, I did drugs, but... I was one of those, oh, let me try that. And then something that makes me lose control, mm -mm, not a fan. I know alcohol did, but I could snap out of that quicker than I could fucking taking a pill or snorting something. But if you're struggling out there, you know, find something to fight for. And don't give up. I'm 52 years old. My body's fucking shot the shit. My mind has shot the shit. But I, I keep struggling on. You can too. Just take it one day at a time, as they say. You'll have good days, and you'll have a lot of bad ones. But the sun always comes out eventually. Well, I appreciate it. Love y'all, and thank y'all.